from Las Vegas, it's The Q. Cover EMC World 2016. Brought to you by EMC. Now, here are your hosts, Stu Miniman and Brian Gracely. Welcome back to the Sands Convention Center here in Las Vegas. This is Silicon Angle Media's flagship program, The Cube. We go out to the shows, help extract the signal from the noise. Uh, I'm actually remembering back to VMworld 2011, uh, probably a yard or two away from where we were right now. We were doing a spotlight on service providers. That was the first time I was introduced to VirtuStream and thrilled to have back on the program Rodney Rogers, the CEO of VirtuStream. You know, Rodney, thanks for joining us. Always great to see you guys. So, uh, what a whirlwind it's been, Rodney. Uh, you know, about a year ago it was announced that EMC was going to uh, buy VirtuStream. Right. Ten months ago it closed over a billion dollars. Now Dell, uh, you, know, you know, acquiring EMC. Uh, where's your head out? Well, yeah, where, where are things going, uh, you know, in your world these days? So, it's been a really busy year. Um, quite an extraordinary year. Um, you know, through it all we've maintained kind of our focus on our core you know, go-to-market approach, the thing that's kind of defined us and let us, uh, you know, find our seam in this marketplace to, to prosecute well against. And now it's really more of an issue of scaling that uh, significantly. Um, our integration in EMC is largely complete. Uh, the integration, uh, the, p the planning process ahead of the potential closure of the Dell deal uh, has been something that's been a bit of a lighter burden on us, uh, as you guys saw yesterday. Um, you know, we're maintaining our operating identity as one of the Dell Technologies group of companies and such. So, you know, Michael's been incredibly supportive of what we're doing, and you know, his his questions to me are more like, "What can I do to support you growing? You know, your growth. What are your impediments to growth? That type of thing." So, w we have our charter. It's it's quite well defined, and you know, my mission is just to continue to prosecute it. Yeah. So Rodney, uh, the first day uh, the press and analysts got uh, a run through of all the announcements. Right. And when it came to Q and A, you know, it was cloud, virtue stream, virtue right. stream. How's this fit? Can you walk us through, uh, you know, what's new? What is just kind of emerging sure. from stuff that you were doing before that now sure. the various pieces that Dell EMC are taking advantage of? Sure. So we have three infrastructures as service platforms. Uh, the first is what we call our virtue stream enterprise cloud. That is Heritage Virtual Streams platform. You know, our whole micro VM technology, resource optimization, built for these IO intensive, mission critical type of stateful uh, workloads. That's kind of our core use case, our core go to market motion. Our Virtual Stream Federal Cloud is essentially the enterprise cloud certified up for FedRAMP uh, FISMA uh, approval. We're IL2 civilian agency certified, so we're one of maybe 30 service providers out there in that regard will be one of a handful that will be DOD certified hopefully by the end of this year at IL4 off-prem. Um, so those are the two sort of heritage of Virtustream platforms, what we brought into the acquisition. What we announced yesterday was the Virtustream Storage Cloud, which was really a project that was incubated inside of EMC for a single customer. Um, for any of those EMCers, you'd, you'd know of it as Rubicon. And it was a, uh, a multi-exabyte, hyperscale type of platform uh, and we brought it over into Virtustream, standing it now and connecting it to the various compute components of our enterprise cloud in support of common compute across uh, all platforms and ultimately uh, hardened it. We wrote a layer of software similar to what we did with Virtustream, you know, that layer of software of Extreme, our CMP largely resides atop VMware's vSphere technology. We've written a layer of software that largely resides uh, atop ECS, which is EMC's object scale out appliance. Uh, and we've you know, hardened the data durability, 13 nines, standard markets about 11 nines, continuous read write over um, uh, full site failure. So we'll, have th we'll be able to offer things like an infrequent access price for a, uh, you know, or offer a premium service or resiliency around an infrequent access price. You know, so you have standard pricing, infrequent access pricing in that industry. And, and the big thing is we're tethered to EMC on-premises storage and data protection devices. So that's a, I mean, it's an obvious strategy, right? EMC is dealing with the emergence of the public cloud, data moving to S3, Azure, and other clouds, other public clouds. So if our customers want a strategy of utilizing a public cloud for you know, tiering of, uh, of policy-based tiering, cold and frozen data, archiving of primary storage, long-term retention of backups, that type of thing. 
we'll have automated connectors, uh, and you guys know how that works. It, it's just more efficient yep. staying in the same software plane. And so all of that's available now. We're rolling, you know, we're starting with VMAX and the MC Data Protection Suite and Isilon. We'll roll out to you know, Unity and VNX and Data Domain and those products throughout uh, Q3. So, uh, you know, you talked, uh, either yesterday's keynote or the first keynote, one of these days, you said, you know, since the acquisition, you've gone through sort of this, uh, I think the word was sort of expansive scaling, right? Um, now that you're going to get in the, you know, the different side of the public cloud market, people are going to want to know what that means. Uh, Amazon tells you where their points of presence are. What, what, what does expansive scaling look like? Where, you know, where are the footprints? Sure, sure. So, the enterprise, the physical cloud node footprint for our enterprise cloud, and for our storage cloud is pretty similar. Um, in fact, we're in a lot of the same facilities. We obviously work to try and make that as efficient as we possibly could. In, the, in, in North America, we have full coverage over multiple zones. Um, in Europe, we're in the UK, Netherlands, France, and Germany. We're just lighting up France and Germany literally this quarter. And we'll expand in Asia Pac in the second half of the year. So, you know, pr pretty strong presence through Western Europe. Uh, my next focus market's going to be Japan and Asia Pac. I actually think for what we do, yeah. Japan could be a second or third largest market for us. Yeah. Uh, the, the other question that, that didn't, I don't know if it got answered, what does is, what is pricing look like for the storage cloud? Um, yeah, so we'll announce that on May 10th when it GAs. Okay. Um, but it, it's quite interesting. We'll be priced, you know, so if you take like a 50 terabyte standard volume, we'll be priced right at where, uh, you know, Google's a little bit lower right now on unit price, yeah. Azure's a little bit higher to equal S3. Um, AWS doesn't have an infrequent access premium service, you know, this certain, yeah. Azure has a premium service for, for in, infrequent. Um, so, but the data points are well known, yeah. they're well published, so, so we'll price right at where S3 will be priced okay. from a unit price perspective. However, we're going to include 20% transaction and egress volume within that price. So one of the tensions in this space is sort of the toll booth yeah. that exists on data coming in and out, right? And we're going to include 20% of that volume as just packaged with that unit price. So the unit price will look similar, yeah. but if you look at the absolute value cost curve, and this will be each client sort of uh, own cost curve. They'll have to determine how much they're going to access this data and where on that price curve we can be advantageous. But our price curve should be lower in most cases. We put a lot of thought into that. Yeah. We figured just pricing unit price at the same uh, transaction cost philosophy would underserve what we're doing. And so we, we have something out there that's quite unique um, yeah. from that standpoint. We'll see how it works. Right, right. The, the other thing that got announced was Pivotal Cloud Foundry yeah. Umbridge. Where does that fit in the, in the portfolio? Is it on the enterprise side? Is it, it is. on the storage cloud side? It's on the enterprise side. Yeah. It's actually, we have uh, a Mirantis OpenStack compute um, system that supports the storage cloud, okay. right? So it, it, from an underlying compute perspective, we'll connect PCF to our enterprise cloud, which would be the vSphere API, yeah. and then we'll use an OpenStack API for you know, uh, more self-service oriented stuff versus managed SLA stuff. Yeah, exactly. And it's interesting, you know, we have a lot of intersection with Pivotal. Pivotal's done a phenomenal job of penetrating large enterprise to sell platforms to develop cloud native apps. Right. So, you know, as we looked at this and prioritized our roadmap, we had a lot of intersecting customers, right? You know, yeah. where we're both in there doing stuff. You, know, you saw, you guys saw uh, Coca-Cola on stage. Right. It's those kind of brands, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of the big stuff. We've been able to kind of gain credibility, improve our, our platform there in that genre of right. customer, and they have as well. And it's interesting, you know, when these customers look to develop cloud native apps, they're looking for a more robust supporting infrastructure. A lot of them will actually implement PCF in their own data centers, yeah. right? And so what we're doing is more emulating that on-prem experience with our enterprise cloud, but allowing them to not provision hardware themselves. Right, so same right? sort of value position you had with the SAP. It's, yeah, you know. and so we're, we're not, you know, one of the things that we're very, very careful to do is not attempt to present us as something, present ourselves as something we're not, right? 2009 when we started, everybody was out there chasing, you know, that distributed general IaaS utility, distributed app in general is IaaS utility. That worked out really, really well for like two people, and yeah. it worked out horribly for just about everybody else. Yeah. Um, we, we chose not to go down that path. I felt it would be venture capital suicide. In, 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 in cloud native, again, we'll start to expand. We can run these types of apps. We're just optimized for our core use case. IO intensive, more scale up, yeah. uh, 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 performant type of requirements. Um, 
so our path here for cloud native was first and foremost getting a platform to develop cloud native apps yeah. and support that with the infrastructure, and then how we expand our use case, we're just going to do that really carefully in terms of how we deploy and run these apps. Yeah. So, Rodney, last year uh, there was a plan to put the virtual stream and the vCloud A or vCloud network under I hadn't heard about a, a, a that. single I roof. So, of, <laughs> uh, of course, there was a little bit of pushback and, and that came, uh, came undone. So, yeah. can you give us kind of the compare, contrast, adoption of you know, virtual stream uh, you know, how's the relationship with kind of vCloud Air and the vCloud Air network? Yeah, so um, that was a, you know, there's, there's a lot of things I can't say publicly about uh, how all that went. I would tell you it was a very well intended, very, very well founded strategy. Um, when we were being acquired by EMC, we were very well, well aware of this. You know, we, first phone call, you know, we got was from VMware, you know, on this thing. And so VMware was looking to participate in, in this endeavor. Um, so when we were, just the speed of the deal, we felt it was necessary for EMC to follow through with a full acquisition, and then we set about structuring this joint venture where VMware and EMC would own us um, uh, together. That would have meant we would have taken vCloud Air and consolidated it with our VirtStream IaaS. It's just a lot, it's just, it, that just makes sense on the most basic level. You're consolidating your as a service in one place, and we were going to move our software portfolio to VMware. This is all public information, right. it's well known. VMware's top enterprise software company, they're going to sell a lot more software than we would have, right? You know, in, in that original construct. And you know, all, all of this was fundamentally done pre-Dell deal economics. You know, the Dell deal came along as a larger deal, and it's, it's, at the end of the day, it just fundamentally, structurally, and from an economic perspective, made sense to not do it. We had relatively well integrated, we had to unwind that, and you know, as it relates to how we collaborate with VMware, we're very close to VMware still. You know, we run 90 plus percent of our workloads on underlying vSphere VMware technology. We're integrating NSX, that's one of the other roadmap items. We will use NSX for network automation uh, here by the second half of this year. So we maintain a very close relationship. VMware has, still has vCloud Air in its portfolio. They've kind of, you know, they publicly stated that they're kind of going to take a very focused use case uh, around vCloud Air, and we're kind of letting them do their thing. Quite frankly, Stu, you know, we didn't compete. VMware and vCloud Air didn't often compete, right. really, very, very, very rarely. Um, and that was one of the things that, you know, the combination was largely accretive in terms of customers and use case and things of that nature. Yeah. So uh, obviously the, the original Virtustream use case was enterprises trusted you to run there, you were running their operations. You know, there are still going to be companies who say, I understand that concept, I like the concept, but I have to have data local, you know, on-prem sure. for whatever reason. You know, we're seeing Oracle get in that space, we're seeing IBM with IBM local. I keep hearing around the floor that, that you inherited this managed service. When are we going to hear more about what's, what that's capable of for customers sure. who say, you know, I, I can't do operations, it's hard. Chad talked about how hard it is on the keynote. When, when will we learn more about that? That's a great point. You know, we tend to talk a lot about the technology, not the service that's running the technology. Um, we did, we brought in 1,200 people or so uh, into Virtustream from EMC's managed services group. And these were, these were professionals that largely managed on-premises um, EMC uh, installations. Um, and we have brought that in. We've integrated our managed services team at Virtustream. So the Heritage Virtustream, we had a managed services group that largely manages the apps and these three-tier application architecture landscapes that reside on our cloud. So we've brought that in, EMC had, a, EMC had great people, a lot of maturity around methodologies, tools, service desk, you know, ticket uh, processing, you know, all the things that you a lot of times lack as a young company, right, as, as one coming up. So we've taken great advantage of that and we've gotten that hardened, and, and you know, the point, the point, you know this, Brian, like, you know, our point of view has always been, we never got involved in those religious debates between public cloud and private cloud. We always felt that was a bit silly. You know, your use case, your consumption is going to need to be just simply driven by where the economics dictate, right, what right. regulatory requirements are there, what latency requirements are there. You know, it's just like, I, I just get a kick out of, you know, you listen to the purists talk about, if an app's not architected to use a public cloud, then you need to rewrite the app. I've seen that very rarely actually occur, you know, yep. at least in, in the stuff that's running the live ammo production workloads and such. And, and, uh, and so, you know, we need to just be prepared to support the app wherever it's running, and yep. that's our objective. And you know, this is a group that we, again, fully intend to scale, you know, with thousands of people. 
All right, so Rodney, I can't let you go without asking you the big question, of course. Heat, still alive. LeBron, still alive. Do you, do you have any torn, uh, you know, uh, uh, allegiances there? You and, know, uh, you know, who, who's going to win the finals this year? Well, the Heat will clearly win the finals this year. You know, I don't think Golden State stands much of a chance. Um, I say that tongue in cheek. You know, we had a couple of great years with, with LeBron down in Miami. You know, when he left Cleveland, they were burning effigies of him, you know, there and stuff. And when he left Miami, it wasn't really like that. You know, everybody was kind of appreciative. They kind of respected his reason for going back to Cleveland. I did. You know, we we're sorry to see him leave. Um, Dwayne Wade has had a total resurgence. I'm not sure what happened there, but he's playing awesome, man. So, you know, we got a good young team. You know, Whiteside and, and uh, Richards. And, you know, th those guys are pretty, pretty, pretty good-looking team at this stage of the game. So we'll see how far they can go. They won against Toronto. My schedule at this thing is, you know, starts at 7 a.m., ends at midnight, so I, I, I couldn't even watch the game, which is like sacrilege for me, man. But um, I, I'm hopeful. And, yeah, the Heat will win it. You heard it right here. The Heat won the champ NBA championship. All right. Well, Rodney Rogers, really appreciate it. I know everybody's going wall-to-wall -wall here at EMC World. Hope to catch up with you much more uh, soon. We'll be back with lots more coverage here from EMC World 2016. You're watching The Cube. Looking back at